So we have already talked about most of these things. I have told you that basically what we need to do is we need to be able to start the building with known sizes and that's our problem that analysis cannot be done unless you know the sizes already. We should be able to we, sh we should be able to use some kind of guidelines to estimating the sizes. Now what are the key things that you want to know in a tall building? What are the very key problems or key key properties that we have to know? Now, of course, there are not response. To start with the building, what do we what do we what do we need to know to start anything? We need to know primarily three things. Main number one, we need to know the floor system. Right? Are we going to use flat slab? Are we going to use beam slab? Are we going to use uh, a steel steel structure there? What is going to be the floor system? And floor system does not really depend too much on the number of stories because it's going to be the same repeated everywhere. So that decision can be made almost independently to the height of the building or number of floors. Only depends on the plan sizes and plan layout of the building. But it's a very important decision because the weight of the building will depend on what system you select. And weight of the building will govern the weight of the weight load on the column, load on the foundation, load on the shear walls, will also govern the base shear, mold shape, everything, mass. So mass is very important. So reducing the mass of the floor system is very important because if you reduce the mass of the floor system, it multiplies by number of floors of stories. So if you have 50 stories, whatever reduction you make, the, the, the advantage is 50 times, not one time. And that is why spending some time on the selection of the floor system is quite important. And there are so many choices of this floor system that we will talk about later that it's amazing. Maybe 40 different systems are available to be selected from. Right? Not 2, 3 or 4, maybe 40 different variations of floor systems are possible and you have to choose the one that you want. But obviously through experience we have found that okay, most likely 10 will be suitable for tall building. Others may not be suitable for tall building for a number of reasons. So out of those 10, you may have to choose one or two and then complete them to find the right one. But again, narrowing down, experience based, these days 90% chances are that you will be choosing a post tension flat slab. That's interesting, new development, right? And now more and more people, first people never thought that this is possible. And this was not a choice. Now, because of many reasons that I will explain later, Post-tension flag slab is becoming a choice, possible choice, and a preferred choice by everybody. Everybody likes that so much because of its many advantages. Interestingly, the building code does not allow that to happen. So if your building is in a seismic zone, it's a highway tall building, they do not allow flag slab in that building. But that is becoming the choice of most designers. Now, people, these, these guys, now a long time ago, 64, 73, 74, developed many systems to be used. So that is the floor system. That's one thing. Second is now the lateral system. What are, what is going to resist your horizontal forces? Sure. Vertical forces will be resisted by floor, whatever you say. And we are saying, okay, post tension flat slab or concrete beam slab or composite steel, that there will be many options, could be selected. So that's one decision is made. Then the question is, who is going to resist the lateral forces? The problem is that in a short building, the beams which are carrying the gravity load and the slab which is carrying the gravity loads can also help in carrying the lateral load. Not in a tall building. We find that those members, you don't want to make them 
part of the literal load system because if you do, then every float will have to be different. Because every float, the horizontal load component is different. It's very small at the top. As you go down, the horizontal force becomes larger and larger and because it's cumulative. Right? So that means the floor slab or floor system in every floor will have to be different, which is very difficult. And the beams will have to be very big. Right? Because the forces are increasing. So we don't want now normally we do not want to involve the gravity load system to be part of the horizontal force system. So we want to find a system for the horizontal loads which is independent, does not depend or rely on the floor system. Right? And that is where these gentlemen, Professor Raman Khan and the warriors and other people, they develop some nice techniques. Right? We will talk about that. And then 75, they also had approximate <coughs> methods of analysis for tall buildings. Now, this is the major quantity of interest to us that we need to really be careful, which is the cost of a structural system, which is dependent on the weight, pounds per square foot or kilogram per square meter. That means what is the quantity of concrete per kilogram, concrete weight per square meter of the building area? What is the quantity of steel kilograms per square meter? Because that will determine the cost of the building. So when you are selecting systems, ultimately this will be something that you need to worry about. You also need to reduce the weight and the cost because two components are interconnected. If you use more concrete per square meter, it has more weight and also more cost. And when it has more weight, more forces. So it affects everything. So reduction of this parameter is quite important in whatever you are trying to do. Right? So that should be the target to achieve a minimum weight per square meter of the floor area for whatever system we are selecting whatever material there is going to be. Even the columns are measured the same way. Column, total column weight in one floor divided by the floor area, that is an indicator. Shear walls in one floor, all the shear walls in one floor divided by the floor area, that is an indicator. So ultimately the indicators become the quantities per square meter or per square foot, which relate to cost, which relate to weight, which relate to everything. So that is something that you need to quickly be able to compare right away between two systems. Then stiffness of the system is also associated with weight in a way. Right? Actually the mass and stiffness will be key components for the response. Right? And stiffness is associated with weight because the section sizes and stiffness are interrelated and mass is interrelated. So it's a complex problem. An ideal structural system could be the one in which the steel quantity to carry the gravity load alone could carry the wind load now or the lateral load. Now this is an interesting statement. Ideally speaking, a system which does not require any additional steel or concrete to resist the lateral load, that means only the gravity load design system can also take horizontal loads, will be the least cost solution because you're not adding anything for the literal load but obviously that's not going to be possible but the target is something like that so first of all you calculate a building parameters as if there is no horizontal load right just design for gravity load and you get the number everything cost per square meter concrete per square meter steel per square meter and then you add lateral loads and you see what is the premium that you have to pay. And if that premium or that extra cost or extra is too high, then your system, lateral load resisting system is not that good. So, first of all, optimize the gravity system, right? And then start the horizontal system and try to keep it minimum addition, right? So these are some of the ways that you could. So these are the concepts 
what you have to consider. Number one, you have to keep the, the quantities of the weight minimum, which will reduce the cost, which will also reduce the mass, which will also reduce the forces, which will also reduce the enforcement risk cycle. So we need to keep the mass low and we need to keep the, the weight of the things low. Secondly, the premium for lateral loads should be minimal. So that's why we try to utilize what we already have to carry the lateral loads. And for that, the tubular system is found to be one of the most efficient ideas. That it almost adds nothing. Interestingly, it almost adds nothing to the gravity load system and yet takes all of the lateral load system extremely efficient idea, right? And that's why when our friend was saying shear wall, shear wall, shear wall, I didn't want him to jump to shear wall because shear wall adds things to the gravity load that we don't really need. So shear wall may not be the most economical, suitable, best option to go for a tall building, but often is the easiest one to use. So optimization, formulate design objectives, so on, structural modeling, structural analysis, check design performance, it is design okay, optimize not, so otherwise you keep repeating. And frankly speaking, you can never optimize something completely, it's impossible, right? Because so many things of the optimization, I don't even want to talk about the optimization here, but practically speaking, pure optimization or perfect optimization is not possible, not practical, right? So we look at a certain global optimization level that we can we, we can accept. But every solution has room to improve. But when you improve it in one area, it becomes bad in another area. For example, just to continue this discussion, very important, column size, right? You're trying to find the column size or the optimum column size or the best column size. Obviously, ground floor, if it's a 50 story building, ground floor column has the highest weight. So you need a certain size. After 10 floors, the road load is reduced. So you need another size. So another 10 floors, on every floor, the load is reducing and you can theoretically keep changing the column size as you go up, right? That will be optimum design from the point of the calculation of this one. But almost no tall building does that. Why? Because the contractor has to make form work every 10 floors. Everything has to be changed and it becomes uneconomical on that side. So if your optimum solution which looks very good on one side becomes unoptimum and the window sizes have to be changed, the cladding system has to be changed, Fixing has to be changed, everything has to be changed when you change the column size and nobody likes that. They want quick construction, straight. So you end up having a highly non-optimized column but an overall optimized building. So optimization of the structural system is may not be the same as optimization of the whole building. So your decisions that you think are very genius may be very bad for the building, right? That's why we have to look at the bigger picture in, in that case. So you can change the enforcement. So what do we do then? We, we change the, we keep the size same, but we change concrete strength, very high strength in the lower floors. As we go up, instead of changing the size, we reduce concrete strength and reinforcement ratio. So we end up with a good optimized solution, but not the size optimization. Strength, concrete strength, and reinforcement quantity, and reinforcement strength can also be changed. So you, you obtain economy through other means, right? And that is where the tall building design is different, that you don't think only about the sizes. You also think about the material strength that you're going to use. So for lower columns, very high strength concrete, the most high strength concrete your country can produce should be in the lower columns. The maximum possible theoretically, practically that you can get 
you should use that concrete strength on lower floors. Then as you go up, then you get the size. And then as you go up, keep the size same, reduce concrete strength every few floors. Then you save money in concrete. Put the maximum reinforcement at the bottom and gradually keep reducing as you go up. So that way you can get some optimization without changing the other things. So preliminary sizing depends on not only finding the right size, but also finding the right material strength to be used. In China, what they do is that they not only start with a column at the ground floor, which has the highest concrete strength and highest reinforcement, they also put a steel column inside, make it composite. And gradually, they take it out as they go up. So they make a composite column with steel section, high section, so it says steel column inside a concrete column with reinforcement, with high strength, everything they can put. So the column size will be small, right? And then as they go up, they keep taking things out and they go up, right? Now, why is column size so critical? Cellular area. If your column is too big, you are reducing the area that they can sell. And the Cellular area of a tall building in Bangkok, let's say, the price is, what do you think, how many, what is the price of one square meter area in a tall building apartment or office? 100,000 baht is typically the selling price of one square meter of space in Bangkok. So that means one, one square meter about size of this table is 100,000 baht. So if your column is one, one meter by one meter, you are losing 100,000 baht for that person per floor, not one time, 50 times. So if you made a column too big, you lost the client the opportunity to sell that area 50 times, which with 500,000, 100,000 multiplied by 50, 5 million baht, straight away gone because you made the column too big. One column, there are 30 columns in the building. So, your cost optimization, the client is ready to pay, put a steel section inside which will cost nothing to reduce the concept column area. Same is the case with shear walls, right? So, structural parts have to be really reduced, vertical parts especially, so that the cellular area, net usable area can be increased. Okay. So you target for highest possible strength of concrete and steel, maximum, and then you target for smallest column size at the ground floor, and that's how you go up. Okay, that's the rule for preliminary sizing of columns in a tall building. Same rule applies to shear walls. Sometimes in a building we are we want to increase the shear wall, it's the shear wall is coming out to be let's say one meter thick, and we want to increase it 1.1 meter. We cannot. Nobody will allow that. They will say, put steel plate inside, do whatever you like. We will not let you increase the wall thickness even by 10 centimeter because it will eat up a lot of space. Now, the span length in the floor system governs the Floor system, right? And again, the argument what I told you applies. Minimum columns, because every time you put a column there, it heats up the floor area. So the client is ready to pay for a expensive floor, long span, rather than many columns. So instead of let's say in a normal building, if the grid column spacing is six meter, which is quite common in most buildings. Tall building, they will prefer it to be 12 meter or 11 meter, right? Most of the buildings that you see these days, their design is like this. There's a central core and there is only one row of columns outside, in between no columns. So that space is typically 12 meter or 13 meters, right? So that means you need to find a flooring system which can span 10, 11, and 10 is Typical up to 12 is 12 meter is quite a lot of space, right? 
So you need to span that much. So you need to find a system which will be suitable for 12 meter. That's why post tensioning comes in because it helps you to span long, longer spans. So you have challenges on the floor system because the spacing of the column is too big and you have challenges then to column size because they want the minimum column size. So they only want the column outside the building, not inside. Right? So this will these are some of the rules. I don't want to go into too much, you can read this one about how to find the cost, the size of a typical column, most of it what I've already talked about. Some applies to tall building, some is general. These are some of the rules. For example, deeper member also affect mechanical architectural cost and increase the floor height. This is an important thing to note here. So if your floor system is going to increase the floor height, now you see this is everything is opposite to each other. They want longer spans, smaller floor height, smaller column, taller building. So, they want everything which is counter logical, it's not logical, but that's the challenge. Okay. So now what they want is they want long span, but they don't want to increase the depth of the beam because if you increase the depth of the beam, let's say 15 centimeter in one floor, 50 floors multiplied by 15 centimeter, how much is that? Fifteen multiplied. Okay, let's say ten centimeter. Ten centimeter multiplied by fifty. Five meters, right? No. Yeah. So that's five meter. Five meters is equal to two floors. That means you are eating up two floors of the building by increasing the height of the girder by ten centimeter. And each floor they can earn hundred thousand baht per square meter. So if there is a restriction in the building that you cannot make a building more than. 100 meters, normally the height is restricted. So if you make the floor height smaller, they can add one more floor or two more floors and make more money. So they don't care about your beam, they want no beams if possible. That's why flat slab is there. So if you put a flat slab instead of a beam, beam let's say is going to be for a 12 meter, typically the beam will be about 1 meter or 80 centimeter deep. A flat slab will be 250 millimeter. So you take out the beam from there, you reduce about 30, 40 centimeters, but floor multiplied by 50, you give them opportunity to add four floors. Multiply by 100,000 baht per square meter, right? 500,000 baht per square meter, they earn more on their building. So you are irrelevant to them. You know, your problems are not their problems. You are creating problems for them by asking for bigger beams, bigger columns, bigger things. So mentality has to be changed, tall buildings, because everything is a game of number of floors, floor area, sellable floor area, right? So priorities for structural system selection change. What you will do normally in a small building does not work in a tall building. And that's something that you need to remember. Column sizes, column arrangement, other things, these are important, but for, as I said, typically for tall buildings, the columns, we try to keep them you know, square or invisible, right, on the outer side somewhere. And there's so many options, you know, for, for this one, we'll go, go along. So the floor framing is usually about 20% of the structural weight, right? So we have to optimize it, maybe sometimes more. Span to depth ratio, spacing of beams, slab thickness, compos composite design, openings for mechanical ductwork work should be carefully considered. So these are the things that you need to consider. These are some other concepts that will come in. I will show you pictures, I will show you other things after that, but you need to understand one interest, important concept, in, especially in tall buildings, the shear lag effect. Shear lag effect. Shear lag effect is that when the building, tall building bends, the deformation from one side to the other side are not linearly distributed. 
they lose some flexibility in between there is a flexibility of the framing system so from this side to this side you do not get a straight bending as you would in a in a solid cantilever building because of the shear deformation of the beams and slabs and other things that connect this face to that face so that shear lag effect is quite important in most of the structural systems that you will that we will be discussing and because of that shear lag effect building deformations become large larger than they should be because of that the vibration or the initial period become larger than they, they should be and the force distribution in floor system becomes larger than they should be so shear lag effect is something that we need to understand and we get new terms spandrels that we will explain you know. so i'm going to show all of this to you later transfer beams and steel use of steel yeah right so we, we can come back to this after we have seen a few diagrams of the things so simplified modeling how can you do a quick modeling simplified modeling to do a back of the envelope calculation right so these kind of models are based on those things things that you can do quickly by hand without running to the computer because computer modeling takes a lot of time computers are supposed to be faster yes after we have created the model but the modeling takes a lot of time right so stick model quite popular this one sandwich beam model cantilever tube model shear flexion flexion model reduced order continuum model these are all very complex this is the easiest one stick model you think of the building as just a stick forget about that there are columns in there forget about that there are shear walls in there because it's so long so tall that actually it's really a stick and forget about the internal configuration of the stick for a minute and you treat the whole building as a stick as if it's a single stick and then you do the calculation for that stick total bending moment total shear right as if there is not no column inside there's no shear wall inside and based on those total forces then you size various things so don't worry about calculating the forces in individual members because you may not even know those individual members yet you would rather do a calculation of the stick of the building and get the forces total weight of the building total bending moment from the wind force total bending moment from earthquake and estimate what the mass per unit length will be right after that you have those forces then at each floor level you can find what do i need to resist those forces is just like taking a column single column putting a horizontal load there calculating the bending moment and finding out how much reinforcement you need so individual bar you can assume as a column right and the rest of the concrete as your floor so you can use that concept of the stick and then you can just get total Effective plant in that way you consider that stick to be hollow or solid, equivalent solid or equivalent hollow, either way. So it requires a little bit of conceptual thinking, but once you get it right, it's so quick and often very reliable. In fact, the first computer software ETABs when it came up, initial models, was simply analysis of a stick model. because they used the concept of the rigid rigid floor diaphragm and there were only 3 degrees of freedom per floor so the building is 30 story there only 90 degrees 90 degrees of freedom nothing and they would solve it like this because there's no memory but the point is that they consider at that time even if you model the whole building it is analyzed as a stick one they assume that each floor can only move in three directions so it's only 3 degrees of freedom a simple beam has 60 degrees of freedom so basically we will reduce it to a very simple model even in computers second one is sandwich beam model right so basically you assume that there is a beam with 
many components, it's a sandwich of various components. Then cantilever tube band model, which is something like this. Shear pressure correction model, which is in, in, including the shear band effect that we, we, we talked about. And then reduced order continuum, this is a little bit more complex. So we don't actually out of these, any worthwhile model is this one and this one. The others still require you more work. ACI came up with this nice guide, guide to simplify design for reinforced concrete buildings. Unfortunately, not for tall buildings. So this is a very good guide, but it will work for low-rise buildings. Not many of the things that they discuss may not work for tall buildings, but anyway, as engineers, you'll be designing everything. So if you want to design buildings, there's a guideline who helps us to design carry out the preliminary design of buildings. The cost sensitive design, very quickly, I will not spend too much time on it. We are talking, we have talked about it, that cost is going to be an important thing, but we need to understand what is cost, right? And where is the cost saving that can be done? And we should not be saving cost in the wrong places. So, we have to just make sure that, look at the cost, and also remember, cost has so many levels. Financial cost, planning cost, infrastructure cost, maintenance cost, incidental cost, liquidity cost, opportunity cost, environmental cost, so many costs. For example, the cost of getting a loan to build a building and paying the interest is far higher sometimes than other things. Right? So if, for example, if you make a building and it's delayed, you have to, your loan is, you know, your income is delayed by one year, right? You put up a structural system which takes longer to build, that means the contractor has to, or the owner has to wait one more year before he can get an income and pay back. So the interest of one year on, you know, 10 million dollars that he borrowed will be far more than anything that you can save him, right? So the big picture is very important. So even if you spend more on a structural system and you can prove that you can make it faster and you can save on his interest, then you can justify your spending. But you need to know these things before you can talk to the client about this. Similarly, other things. So just be sure, be, be aware that cost is not just what you're making. Cost is a big issue. This is a typical breakdown. Planning and design cost, direct construction cost, Supervision and maintenance cost of a building project. Within that, architectural design is the that much. Site development is that much. Structural shell. So, give you an idea where the cost of the building is going. You can see planning and design cost. You people guys get nothing. Architect takes all the money, right? You'll be lucky even if you get twenty percent, right? If you work for the architect, you'll probably get nothing. So. But this is just to give you an idea of where the so you can see from here that this one structural shell is only about 25 to 45 plus 40 percent. Architectural finishes are the one. So ultimately, if you can make an economic sense for your decisions to the owner, your decisions will be accepted. If you cannot make an economic sense to the owner, your decisions will not be valued. Right? So this is all about the cost. The importance of spending money should be demonstrated or should be you should be able to defend it. So this is just to give you an idea within the building that how much person goes to concrete, steel, how much person goes to this one. This is this will give you a very good idea of where the cost of the building is. You can see interestingly that if you make a concrete column or beam, steel, concrete and homework nearly have equal cost and often we forget that. We often forget the cost of homework. So the homework cost is substantial, almost 25% of the cost of the member, which is temporary, which just goes away. So if you can make a design which can reduce the homework cost alone, your design becomes more economical. 
you don't have to design, you don't have to reduce column steel and concrete. Reduce the former cost. Right? So we should know where the cost is going and we design accordingly and then make our designs acceptable. This is again a little bit of the details about the element, you know, the, uh, one particular element, what is going on into that element and it's difficult to read on this slide. Optimization, you talked about optimization of the cost and just remember cost optimization, cost consciousness, cost east, cost low cost has many terms and each term has a very different meaning. But ultimately what we are looking at is this curve, oh, sorry, last two slides of cost. This curve, this is the curve of the optimum solution, right? Whenever, whatever you are doing in anything, at some point in that variable range, whatever you are looking for, it will be uneconomical. Once you change that variable, the performance or cost or whatever you are talking about will become low until the slope becomes zero and then it will start to rise again. Right? So we are looking for this point in the for example, to give you an idea, to make it clear, concrete column, again coming back to the column because it's easy. You have concrete there, you have reinforcement there, you have concrete there. Right? If you make the column bigger, you need less steel. Right? So the cost of the steel will come down, but the cost of concrete will go up and the cost of homework will go up. Right? If you reduce the column size, the concrete and but steel will go up. So there is going to be balance somewhere in which the former and concrete and steel they will all have the minimum balance side and after that even if you go this way or that way cost will go up. Right? So the column size which gives you the least cost of the former this and concrete and steel at the same time is your optimum solution. Right? So if you increase the size a little bit, steel may come down, but concrete and form work may increase, so you become under, under. So it is possible to achieve an optimum column size for one floor. Right? But as soon as we go to the next floor, same column size will not be optimum anymore. Because loading has changed. Right? But then we still keep it the same because now we are looking at not optimization of one floor, we are looking at optimization of the whole column along the height. So other factors come in. So a solution which is optimum for one member is not optimum for a set of members. And a solution which is optimum for a set of member is not optimum for the whole building construction. And a solution which is optimum for the whole building construction may not be optimum for the whole system, which includes other things also. And a solution which is most economic, maybe very optimum for the whole building solution may not be optimum for the long term maintenance of the building. Right? So there is no single optimal solution that will optimize everything. That's why people use life cycle analysis to find the best solution not of the construction today, what happened before, what, ha will, what will happen in the next 50 years and what will happen when the building is demolished. Right? So if you consider the whole life cycle optimization and if you can optimize that, then it will be really good. But that invariably, almost always result in an unoptimized building to build with. Right? which the client will not accept because the client is paying for it. He doesn't care what happens to the building when it's sold. Right? So he's not interested in the rest of the life cycle optimization. So typically a building that they design now, a tall building, is not an optimum solution for the life cycle because 
the people who made it have only a short term view. Right? So anyway, this is a whole new whole idea. So when you design something, you should at least know that what you're doing has a very long time impact. And also optimization levels, micro, micro level, micro level, local level, global level, universal level. So you should see what are you trying to optimize. And a lot of engineers spend too much time here. They don't see that side. Now we come to the interesting, important concept related to the playway design, which is the premium for height. What does it mean, premium for height? What do you understand by this term? How much I have to pay, or you have to pay, to make the building taller? Not in terms of money, but in everything. What is the cost of making buildings taller? Which also tries to answer the question, how tall I can go? Right? In other way. So, we are trying to see, are we paying too much to make it all building? Is it justifiable? So, we should be able to separate, like I said in the beginning, the cost of just only designing for gravity loads and designing for lateral load because of the height of the building. And this discussion is here. Concept of premium for height. Now please look at this graph and try to see what we are saying. This is the floor framing, which is constant. Right? Every floor we assume it is designed for its own gravity. It, it, it doesn't matter whether you have 10 floors, 1 floor, 100 floor. The cost of one floor framing we assume remains the same because we are not linking it with anything else. Right? This is the increase in the cost of the columns as you go up. Right? Because the load is added. So as you go up, the premium for height will keep increasing. For zero story, there is no load. But as we go up, this will be keep adding and this, this graph will linearly increase. So if you have 10 story, column load is 100, 20 stories, 200, 30 stories, 300. Because it is simply number of floors being added. So this will go like this, like a linear, so that's fine. Problem is here. The lateral bracing or lateral system that you need to resist the lateral load, that increases by a curve of higher order, not linear. So, you cannot say that from 10 stories I have a certain cost, for 20 stories the cost will be double. No. It will be maybe 2.5 times. Another one, 3 times or 4 times, and so on. So, every 10 stories will add higher multiplier for cost as you go up. Why is that? This is only for weight. Earthquake will be even worse. Yes. First of all, why is this like this? The equation of the wind pressure is velocity squared, I think, right? And velocity is increasing as you go up. So when the velocity is increasing and the force is increasing, pressure is increasing by velocity squared. So definitely the forces are increasing, not straight line, but they're going like this. So if the forces are increasing like this, your literal system will have to be increased like that. So that means after some time, this curve will just become too much to handle, right? So this premium of height for height, and you can see from here, structural steel pounds per square foot for typical building. Let's say for gravity, it was 8. For column, when we do, it becomes 20. And for lateral, it becomes 50, right? 
so huge premium we have to pay for height. That is why you see all these tall buildings reducing height at the top because as the wind pressure is increasing, they are reducing the area exposed to wind, trying to keep the forces straight and trying to avoid this curve and trying to make it linear so they can go higher. Right? So that is one way to beat this curve is to reduce, this is assumed straight height. So if you reduce the height in the same proportion that the wind is increasing, you end up with a straight line increase which gives you less premium and you can go taller. Right? So this is using conventional system. There are other ways to prevent this from happening. Right? Tubular system, for example, does not follow this law. Right? That follows another law. And that's another way to handle this problem. And people combine now reducing the height and also using tubes. So they get double advantage. And that's why 800 meter or 1 kilometer tall buildings are possible. Which were not even thinkable a few years ago. So, in concrete construction, major factors responsible for reducing reinforcement in concrete quantities are number one, new framing techniques such as skip joint construction. That means you reduce the connections between columns and means. You skip alternate connection, make them longer, or, or so column instead of connecting the columns every floor, you. Because every time you have a connection, you have splices, you have joint reinforcement, you have so much cost. So if you avoid connection, then you don't need. See, the interesting thing is, the column in a tall building is at least 1 meter by 1 meter minimum, you know, in a typical tall building. And it's only going 3 floor high. You don't need to have a joint. It doesn't need a joint there. It doesn't need a bracing. This column can easily go 5, 6 meter without any problem. So if you put a floor in between, you're simply adding to the cost a lot. So if you can skip that and connect every other floor, right, then it's good. And for some, so what people do is, structural floor height is two floor, and then they hang one floor from the other floors later. Recast, recast or whatever, even the cast in place floors, you know, they can come and build later. It makes it easier, you know. Instead of making every floor, you make a floor every two floors and leave one floor Plan and come and make it in another lighter system and hang it up or so you don't need a joint or put it on a corbel. So your main structural system is two floor high or three floor high and that's what you make and then you come back and then you hang the floors or make the other floors only two floor high supported by these primary floors. So you create a composite system in which you have a building with a floor height of 9 meter but the column is good enough for 9 meters, small column. And then you say, okay, after that I'm making two floors, like intermediate floor on a real floor, right? So those kind of things really reduce the cost and weight of the framing and other things. Increased use of mechanical couples, couplers for, for you know, instead of using lap splices, you use mechanical connections between V bars because you waste a lot of reinforcement by overlaps, splices. So you don't use that. You bring the concrete bar, big bars together, put a mechanical coupler between them so you reduce cost. Things like that. Use a wide cage for column ties and so on. So use a high strength concrete, um, use a lightweight aggregate. All of these things can help you save the cost in a concrete structure. So point is think outside what you know. Right? Why does that floor have to be 3 meter, every floor? Yeah. Yes. So, also design a system in which the glass curtain can be reduced. So, that has a lot of weight. So this is another way of the same graph put in this way. So this is a very interesting 
Now, if you put the reinforcement like this, or you put the reinforcement like this, or you put the reinforcement like this, it changes the performance. It does not change the cost. So, just rearranging the reinforcement can give you benefits because you just know where it is needed. For example, A is here, B is here, and C is here, A is here. So, basically what you can do is, you can increase the performance by simply rearranging the bars to where they are more effective, right? So, you get higher performance for the same cost, right? Or, in other words, in other way, you can reduce, you can get the same cost as A with the reinforcement which is optimized in such a way that you use larger bars and more bars, fewer bars, but ultimately what you need is you do not need the bars in the middle. They are not effective. Right? So, if you can increase the spacing with larger bars and fewer bars, you can get almost the same capacity as that one. Right? Or you can get a higher capacity and reduce the cost. Right? So, this is lower cost, the same performance, this is the same cost with higher performance. And this is the best, best one. So, these small things can help you to optimize the design. Alright? Any questions?